Okay, we talked about all these. We're gonna move ahead. Uh, mild and moderate depression. You know, the bottom line is everyone needs to go to therapy. And if you're not in therapy, get into therapy. It's helpful, okay? <laughs> Um, 40 to 70 percent of depression responds to SSRI, which is the antidepressant. But we don't want only to treat just the depression. We need to build coping skills. We need to figure out how we can increase communication. Because as you can see, if they don't know that they're taking, if they think they're taking an SSRI and it actually is a placebo, 30 to 60 percent get better. So why did they get better? It wasn't the antidepressant. What was it? Was it the therapy? Was it the fact that they felt hopeful, right? Was it all the attention? Was finally someone starting to help me and now I feel like I can, you know, relax a little bit and express myself and all. So there's a big placebo effect. That's a good thing. That means that we do need to pay more attention to these individuals. It's not all about medication. Uh, looks like that, like if there was an Uh, risk of suicidal ideas, well, there still aren't enough studies in kids, okay? Unfortunately, now this past year, some studies have, uh, various studies have come out where the antidepressants are really not effective in children. Okay. Kind of scary because we've been using them, right? But then when we don't use them, then there's more depression and suicidality. So. A lot of how the studies are done have a lot to do with the results, okay? We certainly have studies that show that fluoxetine helps. Does that mean that Celexa, Lexapro, Cymbalta, and all those other medications don't help or do help? We don't know yet. We don't have enough studies to say that, right? And the studies are usually not for a year, for two years, for three years. They're eight-week studies. How long does it take an antidepressant to kick in? Six to eight weeks. Right? So the, the information is very limited. Um, okay, finally, bipolar. I've got 40 minutes to talk about bipolar disorder, which is actually what I love to talk about. Okay, bipolar disorder one, you have a manic episode. It should last about seven days. Clearly, you have to have a manic episode. Manic episode, el elatedness, grandiosity, uh, no need for sleep. Not that you cannot sleep, you just don't need to sleep. You have tons of energy. Uh, um, racing thoughts, whole bunch of things in your mind. If you are a talented and creative individual, then it will show even more so. If you're organized and not psychotic. Bipolar does not make you creative. You were creative and talented before, and then you show it more when you're cycling. It's not the other way around, okay? So, and I say that because sometimes teenagers like the feeling of being manic -y. And they say, I'm just more creative, and I just draw better. And you look at your drawings, and you go, oh, you're not that great, kind of thing. Um, so it makes them, because they're grandiose, it makes them feel that way. But for individuals, and you know you've heard a whole bunch of individuals out there that are very talented, and it does show even more so when, when they're cycling and not psychotic. Bipolar 2, it's major depressive episodes with hypomania uh, lasting four days. In other words, not full-blown mania. But there is more increase in energy, uh, decreased sleep. They're not, necess they're not psychotic. And bipolar NOS is, I don't know, it's not one, it's not two. It's NOS. Okay. Very important. Uh, 0.5 to 2% bipolar one, uh, lifetime prevalence, and bipolar two is about you know, 0.5%. 0.5% of individuals with which are diagnosed as bipolar in adulthood present at five to nine, right, or are diagnosed. 7.5 within 10 to 14 years, greater in males. See, the younger the age, the males, are, it's more common in males. Um, and then by 20 to 30% before the age of 20 are diagnosed with bipolar disorder if they're gonna be bipolar in adulthood, okay? We've lost some people there. Right? We've lost some people. So, so maybe the bipolar disorder that was diagnosed as childhood isn't necessarily going to be the bipolar disorder in the future. Genetics, I'll let you kind of read that again. 76% in monozygotic. It's very close to 65% to in bipolar. Actually, I think it's even higher now the more studies they do. 
but there's some families in Costa Rica that um, are up in the mountains, and they're all bipolar, because cousins marry cousins, and they're all bipolar. Uh, it's really interesting on the studies. Those are the individuals and families that they do studies on to look for the alleles, genetic alleles that are the same. Um, it's a very, you always ask, there's a very high risk, not only if a parent is bipolar, but if they have an affective disorder. In other words, a depressive disorder. So if you have a strong history of, of depression in the family, there is a higher chance of presenting as bipolar. So it's not necessarily only bipolar. The other part of that is, just because you, not a lot of families have been diagnosed. We're still in this generation thing where you say, where you know, your grandparents' uh, um, generation was anyone bipolar? Well, I don't know. Who was going to be diagnosed at that time, right? Even still, in, in, there's a limitation, again, because of whatever reason they didn't want to go in or the family just kind of you know, didn't talk about it much. There's still these generation gaps. People are... The newer generations are much more, thank God, willing to talk about the diagnosis of their family. They'll talk more about their parents than we talked about our parents, right? Um, if two parents have a depressive disorder or affective disorder, there's a 75% risk of the person having an affective disorder. Okay, it's really high. So that's why looking into family issues is very important. And that's the problem in foster care. We don't know. We don't know what's going on with the families. We, get, we lack that information. And that information is very helpful when it comes to diagnosis. So in foster care, we have to do a lot of guessing. But there's also a lot of assumption that the, the child came into care, the majority of birth parents were just um, self-medicating, and they would be self-medicating because their depression can't go by. Yeah, but there's also just a lot of plain substance abuse. And a lot of plain substance abuse makes them look like they're bipolar disorder also. You do a line of cocaine, you're going to be manic, right? <laughs> and you're going to go out and sleep around and sell yourself for money to get more coke. I mean, there are a lot of manic -y behaviors, and they're not. If they're clean, they don't, you don't see those behaviors any longer. So yes, there are a lot of assumptions is what we have to do, which we shouldn't, but a lot of those things, we have to kind of do the guessing games and foster kids. Well, it depends on the condition. We know that, that substance abuse does increase the risk of ADHD. There is neurological. Well, mood disorders, not necessarily bipolar per se, but dys dysphoria, irritability, and all that, yes, it may cause it. Yeah, is there a clear substance abuse causes bipolar disorder? No. There is not that clear association. Okay. Okay, predicting factors of mania. Again, we said rapid on. This is very important. If you have a child that comes into your op office, they are very young, right, five, six years old. They were doing really well for a while, and then all of a sudden they're getting really agitated, really upset. Um, um, Actually, not even so much the, the, they're getting kind of hyper or they get really slow, you know, the depressed. And they're psychotic, hearing voices, seeing things, delusional thinking, right, which is paranoia, for example. People are out to get me. You know, all the little kids in my class hate me. They're looking at me in a bad way. And you're like, no one's seen that, right? That's paranoia in a child. Then there's a higher, higher risk of, of it presenting as mania in bipolar disorder. Family history we already talked about, and our history of mania or hypomania with antidepressants. So if you put a child on antidepressants for depression and they activate, they become manic, it's, there's a higher risk of that actually presenting that they have bipolar disorder and it presented with the antidepressants. But it is not the rule. You can activate an individual with an antidepressant and they do not have bipolar disorder. Adolescents can present more clearly like adults clear-blown mania, like we talked about. In children, we have something called juvenile mania. It doesn't present, you know, with this grandiosity. They don't even have all those concepts yet. They can have inappropriate self-soothing behaviors. So when the child is self-stimulating, masturbating, they're not thinking hot guy or the hot girl, da-da-da-da-da kind of thing. They're just finding the because they become very sensitive in their sexual organs, right, whether it's their penis or the clitoris, they're going to self-stimulate. 
Okay? And so that's when we come to, you know, the parents describe that as dry humping and inappropriate sexual behavior, and then they get curious about breasts and that kind of thing. It's not sex. You know, they're not thinking that. It's because there is some pleasure in that. There's this different sensation. That's part of what you can see in the juvenile mania. That is very important. They're also much more curious in the body parts of other people that they find pleasure in in their own bodies. And that's why they might touch other people. Now, we're taking out anything that has to do with sexual abuse, right? Because that's a whole different thing that can bring this up, right? So we're just eliminating that. We're saying this child has never been sexually abused and their parents are on them like a hawk 24 seven and no one has ever abused them, right? They can still have these behaviors. And it brings up red flags. You know, people go, oh, has this child been abused because they're doing this kind of weird stuff? Okay? So that goes along with juvenile mania. Mixed features are more common. When we talked about mixed features, it's not about being super happy. It's about being very energetic and angry. Okay? So it's the depression, but with anger and just all this energy and intense agitation, and you can feel it. Right? Their level of frustration, it's just you can, you can feel that when those kiddos have these episodes. And then it, there's a high rate of disruptive behavior. In children with juvenile mania, it is very common to treat, not to treat, to diagnose them first as ADHD, hyperactive form, then of anything else. So when you see these adults that are finally diagnosed with bipolar disorder, you go, well, what other things have you seen a psychiatrist? Oh, I was, when I was five years old, I was diagnosed with ADHD. And they put me on a whole bunch of medications, and the medications never worked. And actually, they put me on Ritalin. It was horrible. I never want to take it again. My parents told me that I just was even more aggressive, that kind of stuff. So it actually wasn't an ADHD. Uh, it wasn't a child with ADHD. It was not ADHD. It was, it was their bipolar starting to come up. Okay? Kiddos don't cycle like adults do. Clear cycles. Kiddos cycle. Right? So it seems to be a more sustained episode. So is juvenile mania the same thing as adult mania or adult bipolar disorder? We don't know. Or there's, the studies are coming out. It seems like not necessarily. Not all kids that are diagnosed with bipolar disorder will be bipolar disorder when they're adults. That's great news. But try to figure that one out. right? Try to figure that out when they're kids. It's going to be. I, you know, until more studies come out, it's kind of difficult to say which ones are going to be. What's the frequency of the, the mania in the juvenile? Is it always twice a week? You know, I don't know what the statistic of clear mania, like adulthood mania, I don't know. It's very low. I mean, if it's 0.5 in just uh, mixed episodes, I can't imagine how, I don't, maybe 0.1, right? But I'm not sure. I'm not sure what number to get. Now, the other diagnostic controversy, and this is, it is a, one of the criteria for bipolar disorder for the manic symptoms is that they have decreased need for sleep. Very common in, in adolescents, very common in adults, not in kids. In children, in younger children, you can actually, and these are things that are coming out more because when I was taught about bipolar disorder, even in kids, one of the criteria, because of the DSM-4, it was still that you have a decreased need for sleep. So your child cannot be sleeping Right? If they're sleeping, they don't have bipolar disorder. Forget it. That's not the case. Right? This other condition, juvenile mania, that maybe isn't the same adult uh, bipolar disorder, the kids can sleep, but they have a disturbance. Maybe they wake up five times a night. Right? Maybe they have nightmares. Right? So there might be a sleep disturbance, but it's not necessarily decreased need for sleep. Adolescents that are bipolar, are much more common to, are much more at risk to be adult bipolar. In other words, most of the adolescents that are diagnosed clearly with bipolar disorder are going to have bipolar disorder in their adult age. Okay, uh, acronym for manic symptoms. So kind of the same as depression. It's dig fast, these are the things you're looking for in a manic episode. And this is not juvenile mania, this is an adolescent and adult, okay? But it's helpful. When you're in the office, you ask distractibility. You know, you think about these, this acronym. Okay, treatment. 
for treatment. The treatment of bipolar disorder is not therapy, okay? Bipolar disorder is a medical condition. There's anatomical changes in your brain. There's actually no neurotransmitters that are changed. Medication does help in bipolar disorder, the mood stabilizers. Um, and so medication therapy or, or pharmacotherapy is the main line of treatment for bipolar disorder. That does not mean that we do not need therapy. Therapy is very important. We're going to talk about the details of therapy um, that are needed in bipolar disorder. These are the things that we need to, these are the, the, uh, the topics that we need to really take into consideration when we're choosing medication for a child with bipolar disorder. It depends on how effective the medications are. But if they've never been on medication, how do we know how they're going to respond? Then we jump all the way down. We ask, are there bipolar people in your family? Yes, my mother's bipolar. Or actually, the mother's saying, yes, I'm bipolar. And, and you know, you ask them, are you stable, not stable? Has anything worked for you? It's more likely that the medication that has worked for the parent is going to work for the child, or has worked for the sibling is going to work for the child. Because there is some genetic association. Has it necessarily been studied? No. But is there? Yes. So, and the same thing happens in depression. If Lexapro has helped the mom, and this is a, not bipolar disorder, but depression in an adolescent or child, then you try that medication first. Okay? Because it's more likely that it's going to work. And so you don't waste time, right? And wasting time is spending, you know, just years and years trying to figure out what medication finally works for them. So, efficacy. Phase of the illness, are they depressed? Are they manic, right? Are they in a mixed episode? So that all is very important as well because different medications are used in manic episodes, different for the depressed episodes to kind of stop in the acute phase of these. Um, when we talk about phase also, we're talking about acute phase, which is they just started cycling, or if they are in their maintenance phase, where they don't have the symptoms, but you want to continue treating them so that they don't start cycling again. Additional symptoms such as psychosis. Not everyone that is bipolar has to be psychotic. Right? But if psychosis appears, you have to treat it as a symptom. Side effects and safety. Side effects and safety are very important. Many of these medications Antipsychotics, anti as well as mood stabilizers, have their potential side effects. 